this short documentary series on the humanities in Europe today, uh, which starts from Europe but will expand to cover, I hope, the whole world, is the initiative of the European network of humanities centres and institutes. We decided collectively with our colleagues that it would be a good idea to present a series of portraits of leading figures in the humanities in our part of the world and to use them as sources of inspiration, as role models, if you wish, for practitioners and students alike. The portraits of this very sort of charismatic, highly accomplished, distinguished professionals accomplishes another aim. It allows us to trace a genealogical sort of portrait of where the humanities have been, where they are at today and where they could go, insofar as each person that we interview is asked to trace their own itinerary, past, present and future. And simply by asking a question like, what was your faculty called when you studied as an undergraduate? And noticing the semantic, the institutional, the political transformations that the field has gone through. Just by doing that, I think the viewers should be in a position to measure the extent of the changes and the extent of the vitality of the field. The hope of this mini-series is indeed that we can collectively as practitioners but also as spectators express our love for, our trust in, our respect for this amazing field of the humanities at a time in its history when it is coming under attack in the press, in the public debate, um, in policy making and financial decisions that are really penalizing this field. The humanities in the 21st century as you will see in the different portraits of these great figures we're offering to you, are a vital, vibrant, critical, creative, extremely accountable field, proud of its history, confident of its place in the world, and very hopeful for the future. We really hope that you will enjoy uh, watching these great figures, and maybe you will be yourself tempted to run out and interview somebody that you know in your own neighborhood, in your own circles, because the humanities are everywhere and for everybody. The first day of uh, university education that I got was on 9-11-2001, and it was in Amsterdam. Um, and I remember walking, walking across the Dam Square with my books. I was a history student. I did a history, first year's history degree. Um, and everybody, everywhere it was buzzing, you know, someone attacked the United States, someone attacked the United States. And that was the first day of, of my university education. Um, so I started out as a history student and I moved on towards literary studies. Uh, literary studies didn't have a first year degree then. It's kind of a new study still then. Um, so I did my literary studies BA uh, in, at the University of Amsterdam. And I followed up with a research MA in cultural analysis at the University of Amsterdam, combined uh, in collaboration with the École Normale Supérieure in France and uh, the University of uh, Paris 8, the eighth university of Paris. Um, and I did my PhD studies directly afterwards on the Protestantism and politics. So my roots are in, in literary studies and in philosophy, in cultural analysis of, uh, of both. And I moved towards religion in a time when a lot of theology departments were crumbling. So for instance at Utrecht University where I work now and also at the University of Amsterdam where I was trained, they dismantled theology departments and they were in the process of replacing it with a department of religious studies. It was still very much unclear what religious studies was supposed to do or that, you know, how do we negotiate with the, the past of theology, the ghost of theology, even though a lot of people you know, left the church, theology still reigns over the study of, of religion. So I transformed myself into a, a scholar of religion in a time when the position of religion in the university was, was uh, deeply transforming. From the very moment I started thinking at an academic level, 9-11 kind of framed my, my, my thoughts. Um, and it was clear that religion remained a sort of central point of focus for uh, conflicts in society. And it was also clear that specifically in the Netherlands, uh, the majority of people look upon themselves as post-religion. Right? We left that behind and it is something that belongs in the 50s. Um, the aforementioned you know, annulment of theology departments is a symp symptom of that. People left the church, people left the classical ways in which religion functioned in society. Um, and that is a time of great uh, uh, downfall of the study of religion, but it was also a time of great opportunities. 
new ways of looking at religion opened, up, opened themselves up. So when I finished my research MA, I could choose. Either I could do a badly funded PhD position at, in Paris. I would have funding for sort of more or less two years, and you know. Uh, or I could uh, apply for a position at the University of Amsterdam in the Future of the Religious Past project, which recognized that idiosyncratic position of religion and said, well, we need to invent new ways of interacting with religion and, and the academy. And even though I wasn't raised religiously, and even though I hadn't, didn't have a formal training in theology or religious studies, there was something that appealed to me. Uh, keep in mind, I was also living in, 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 in the Netherlands, where there was a lot of talk of religion everywhere. Of course, Islam, as, as you know, the Dutch other, was, was, uh, was presented frequently as the major problem of the 21st century. But it also uh, reinvented this Christian past. We had a prime minister who was a Christian Democrat who spoke of the Calvinist you know, nature of Dutch society. We have the big populist uh, party who is leading in the polls right now, who spoke of the Judeo-Christian nature of the Netherlands. And no one really knew what that meant. Right? The old spokespeople for religion were no longer as, as prominent. In religion or in academy there was a sort of confusion who was going to speak for this new, for this new society. So it was, an exciting, it was an exciting time and it was clear that there was societal relevance in the study of religion, which is not, um, you know, which shouldn't be dogmatic, shouldn't be theology old school, but it shouldn't fall for the secularist self-image which reigns in, 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 in Dutch society and academy at large. So that's what, what's, what I guess I, it drew me, something really uh, with societal relevance. Um, and it led me to write a book in 2009 on uh, the notion of Calvinism in Dutch national self-identity, uh, which in 2009 was the, uh, 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 the 500th year, was commemoration of, of the life of John Calvin. And a lot of books came out, and most of them were written from a confessional perspective, almost all of them. Um, so you get these books that were dedicated to God and dedicated to, you know, written with a sort of clear veneration for a tradition. And I thought, all right, what's lacking is a sort of uh, uh, perspective that takes this religious force in national identity serious, but it doesn't really confine itself to, you know, defending a confessional position. So I wrote that book, um, and it was interesting that it got framed in an interesting way, right? So uh, people picked it up, and um, in one review stated, well, you know, even a leftist postmodernist is now interested in the work of John Calvin, which shows that religion is back on the agenda. And I got framed as part of a, you know, a national resurgence in you know, interest in, in, in religion. Uh, the prime minister referenced my book stating, you know, and so wonderful that people are so interested in the religious heritage of the Netherlands and the great Calvinist identity of the Netherlands. Even a leftist postmodernist is interested in. And so there I was, you know, my work was, you know, framed in a sort of debate on national identity and not necessarily in a way that I liked, right? Studying something doesn't necessarily mean condoning it. This is conf confusion, which in religion, you know, subsist up, up until today. When you say you're a scholar of religion, people say, all right, are you religious yourself? Yeah. And I always have to explain, well, you know, not really, uh, I'm not religious, and that's also not my, my motivation. So that says something, that it's still relatively new. And, uh, postmodernism, right, is of course a term which, which, can, be, which can be interpreted in many different ways. One of the ways in which uh, I have interpreted, in which I have been trained, uh, both in the University of Paris as well as in my undergrad studies, is that there is a sort of challenge not to base yourself on grand narratives which are, you know, carved in stone, which are eternally valid, but at the same time how to engage critically and affirmatively with the challenges of today. That, for me, is a definition of postmodernism. Uh, in colloquial usage, it's often you know, summarized as anything goes, which no thinker who's associated with the postmodern tradition has ever held that position, whether it is Foucault, whether it is Deleuze, whether it is Derrida. None of them have this sort of relativistic attitude. All of them are, in my eyes, right, characterized by the challenge how to engage critically and affirmatively in society without falling for the major grand narratives which you know, created so many problems. In that sense, yes, I'm a postmodernist. Now, am I a leftist? I don't know, right? It's, it's, it's uh, in these days, uh, left and right are positions which are actively changing. Uh, is the left, you know, socialist? Is the left nationalist? You know, is the, the right uh, liberal tradition? And do we mean by liberal the Dutch definition or do we mean the American definition? If you see uh, the crown jewels of sort of progressive uh, leftist uh, thought, right, uh, they are shifting. Whether it is freedom of speech, whether it is uh, tolerance for minorities, whether it is feminism, 
right? All of these sort of things which used to fit in, an, in, a, in, in, in a framework are now adrift and can all of a sudden pop up in, in, in right-wing nationalist frameworks and in left-wing frameworks. So I don't know if I'm a leftist. It's uh, something which uh, I think we all should figure out. I was a horrible student in high school. All right, uh, I had, you know, sixes. That was my, my specialty, to get sixes, which is, in the Dutch system, is the passing grade, right? And I wasn't really aware of the fact that, uh, A, I could do academic work or intellectual work at a high level. I never thought of myself as someone who was capable of doing that. Uh, uh, and B, my results weren't there, so I didn't have, you know, a, 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 a high school which stimulated me to do stuff, you know. Um, yet, somehow, I ended up in university, right? Um, and there, if all of a sudden, when confronted with the tradition of humanity scholarship, whether it is history or literary studies or philosophy or the study of religion, all of a sudden I realized that something awoke in me, something that I want to find out, something that I want to uh, uh, specialize in, that I want to know more. And I found myself, you know, spending the scarce money that I had on, on as many books as possible. So I remember when I studied in Paris, right, I was broke all the time and I remember, you know, having one year of 50 in your bank account and trying to use your bank card to buy some macaroni, you know. But I, I, I had worked it out like that, that I could buy the Pléiade edition of Proust à la recherche du temps perdu and every six weeks. If I saved money, I could buy the edition. So I went to the, to the, the, the Vrain, this, this is the, one of the major libraries at the Sorbonne, every six weeks and I bought my Pléiade edition of Proust à la recherche du temps perdu. Uh, and that is the luxurious edition, right? It is the scholarly edition. And I carried it home to my Chambre de Bonne, which was on the sixth floor of, 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 you know, of this Parisian immeuble, uh, Parisian apartment building. No elevator. So I you know, walked up six flights of stairs. And I remember cherishing that as a you know, prized, prized possession. Still, I still have that set of series. And these six weeks allowed me to read that. It just about allowed me to read it. My French wasn't that good still. Right? And, and I think that shows something that, that uh, I didn't have sort of this sort of interest or this sort of passion uh, from my upbringing or from my early school trajectory, but it, it, it caught me by surprise. And all of a sudden, when I started studying literature, when I st started studying uh, and, and, you know, philosophy and history, I got good grades for the first time in my life. I remember getting like a 9.5 for an essay, for an assignment. I was like, Hang on, this never happened before. What, 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 what changed, right? What, what's, 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 what's the difference? Um, and it turned out that this humanities approach uh, awoke some form of enthusiasm in me, which, I, which fuels me up until today. Academically speaking, I'm an interdisciplinary scholar of religion. Um, that's the short of it, right? Uh, when we elaborate a little bit on that, uh, I'm somewhat of an activist. I do uh, politically engaged work next to my work in academia, but I also combine my work in academia with a sort of politically engaged uh, uh, attitudes and projects. Um, so that's what I like to, that's what I like to combine. As I already mentioned before, right, the choice for religion was already uh, pressed upon me by societal concerns, more or less. And that's something which, which fuels me up until today. The moment it doesn't have that, I notice that I fall back into, you know, uh, um, apathy a little bit. You know, I need the fuel of that something is at stake when I, with, what I, with what I'm doing. That's what gets me up in the morning, that's what keeps me up at night. Right? Um, and the moment, it doesn't, the moment I don't feel that, I find it difficult to concentrate, I find it difficult to, you know. Um, and luckily I, I, I work in a field and I work with people who share that. I have a total of five positions at the moment. Right. I'm a research fellow at the Center for the Humanities, uh, which was my entrance at the, into Utrecht University. Uh, the Center for the Humanities ran a program on the post-secular, and that was one of the few places where a highly developed approach to religion and secularity was, was, was underway, right, which didn't suffer from the uh, traumatic heritage of theology. So that was something that, that, that appealed to me from the very beginning. And that kind of led me into the number of other positions which I have now. I'm a teacher at the Religious Studies Department of Utrecht University. I teach courses on religion and society. Uh, also, my, my work uh, has led to uh, my position at the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences, where I'm a postdoctoral researcher and a secretary for the Foresight Committee Theology and Religious Studies. Um, this Foresight Committee recently published a report concerning the future of theology and religious studies. So I was one of the people who worked on that, on that report. Um, and uh, next to that, I teach at the, uh, the National School of Theology and Religious Studies, which is the, the national research school in which I teach a course for uh, uh, PhD students 
on the methodologies of reading. There is a, so I have five contracts at the moment, and I, it, it can be a little bit of a juggling act. I mean, it, I mean, um, it has its upside, right? I enjoy doing research at the at the at the Center for the Humanities. I enjoy teaching uh, both on an undergraduate and a graduate level, um, and I enjoy branching out into wider fields of academia. And that one of the ways in which you can do that now is by combining functions. So it's already it's also enabled me something. Uh, the downside, of course, is that I work at three or four institutions, right? And if you do a lot of work for one, it's not like you can, you know, sit back and, 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 and have a beer because the other ones are already in the wings, uh, you know. So it, it can be challenging as well. Um, and it depends on, on, on what mood I'm at and, and, and you know, whether I've just survived the deadline or whether I'm in the process of, you know, of, of chasing after a deadline. Sometimes I feel very much uh, blessed that I can have so many different interests and so many different people to work with. And sometimes I, I long for you know, a position at a single department that combines my research and my teaching so that you, know, you can focus and really go more into depth into one, into one place. So it's, it's both a, a curse and a blessing, this current situation. A lot of the people of my generation are job hopping and, and, and um, I see a lot of uh, people having problems with job insecurity. The academic precariat is, is a word that's, that's, uh, that's thrown around. Um, I'm always also a little bit hesitant to, you know, the word precariat is um, something which I think should also be reserved for uh, uh, people who, you know, are truly precarious. In the, for instance, in the Netherlands, I, I do work with undocumented migrants and uh, that for me is true precarity, right? And, and whenever I feel that I'm, I'm called to complain about my, uh, my tough life, I think it's good to and, and, and keep those sort of feelings of self-pity in check by being into contact with, with the people who are uh, truly precarious. Um, however, of course, there are problems. And there are, if you have five contracts and five temporary ones at that, right, uh, it's going to affect your research. It's going to affect your teaching. It's going to affect the, the relationship you have with your students. Right? If they don't know who's going to teach this course next semester, if you don't know if you'll be there next, next, next semester, right? it might affect your relationship with your students. Uh, research as well, right? I mean, writing monographs is a process which takes years. Uh, if, if your research contracts are uh, you know, six months or a year or a year and a half, right? that doesn't give you enough time to really write a monograph. So you do that in the evening hours, which are already packed with other stuff. So next to my academic work, right? I find it important to do work which is not just aimed at peer review or funding or, or um, you know, the academic framework. Um, and with a group of people we've created a, an academy for undocumented migrants which is called the We Are Here Academy. Um, and this has uh, as its goal to show a you know, truly precarious group of people to sh in, in the Netherlands and, you know, and to show that there is something scandalous going on. There's a, a large group of people in the Netherlands, undocumented, mi undocumented migrants. There's a lot of uh, power play at work and words here. You know, people call them illegals, people call them undocumented migrants. Uh, we have taken up uh, the phrase undocumented Dutch citizens. Right? Um, but one of the things that we've done is we've created an academy for undocumented migrants. And what we do there, it's a group of academics who teach uh, at university level who teach the same stuff or, or similar stuff for undocumented migrants in an unofficial academy. Uh, this arose out of the uh, interaction with undocumented migrants in the Netherlands who are often here uh, permanently. Sometimes people are here for 10 years without access to higher education, without access to you know, all sorts of things that we find normal in, in, in codifications of human rights. Right. And within the boundaries of this, of this, this you know, enlightened Dutch nation state, there's a group of people who are systematically excluded from even the most fundamental human rights. So of course housing, uh, uh, food uh, is one of them. Education is also one of them. Right. Education is not for nothing a, a human right, basic human right. And in my work of undocumented migrants, you can see what it does to people to be permanently excluded from developing your mind. Right, to see bright people who have who've, you know, ended up here because of some sort of current which has to do with economy, which has to do with colonialism, which has to do with the war on terror, all sorts of geological current, geopolitical currents, and, uh, with the result that there's a large group of people here with expertise, with knowledge, with hungry minds, with things to share and things to offer to Dutch society, who are systematically excluded from society's view. Right. And education, of course, is one way in which people can develop their minds, people can better uh, influence and understand the currents of the world that brought them here, uh, but it also enables people to speak up 
uh, in more effective manners. Right? And to, to reach these two goals, we created this, the, the We Are Here Academy, which shares academic knowledge with people who deserve it, namely the people who want it. Right? I'm an academic not because uh, of the passports of my students. I'm an academic much like a doctor is a doctor, because there's something which is uh, important behind the idea of sharing knowledge. Yeah, I think my, my future work will be framed by two challenges. One is on a sort of meta level. Right, where there's a study of religion, where is it going? What are its challenges? What are its goals in the near future? And I hope to contribute to shaping the study of religion in a way that better reflects globalized, you know, plural form uh, societies in, in, you know, in our present. That's one, that's the meta level. And my work for the Royal Dutch Academy and my work at, at the Religious Studies Department at Utrecht University hopes to contribute to this new practice of studying religion. Right, which does away with the uh, traumatic heritage of theology, which truly becomes post-Christian, as our world uh, uh, is supposed to be. Um, and the second one is on a more micro level, and which has to do with understanding how religion plays a role in conflicts and identifications of contemporary societies, specifically in Dutch society, which is where my work is, is deeply rooted. Right, so we can see anybody who opens a newspaper we can see religion all over the place, whether it is Islam, uh, whether it is Dutch Judeo-Christian roots or what, what have you. But we've kind of lost the language to make sense of that. We've kind of lost the language to speak of religion in the public sphere. Uh, part of that has to do with the fact that uh, Dutch society has as itself image secularity. We've done away with religion, that's, that's of the past. And somehow we don't have the public language to speak of the influence of religion on public life. Uh, one of the things that I hope to, to contribute to is to find a new language which, which can approach that. So how does the Christian past still inform our present? Where does it lead to problems in a religiously pluriform society? Uh, how can we think of Islam uh, in ways that are not defined by incredibly ill-informed politicians and, 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 and you know, uh, opinionating articles in uh, shoddy newspapers? And there's a specific challenge there that I hope to contribute in. Uh, specifically, what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm preparing a research project on the way in which religion plays a role in populist uh, self-identifications. Right? So whether it is France as Front National, whether it's in Germany, whether it's Pegida, whether it's in the Netherlands, it's, uh, it's the PVV, you see populist parties that are actively reframing what it means to be a Dutch, French or German citizen. And religion plays a huge role in that. Everybody knows that you know, Front National, Pegida and PVV are against Islam. But very few people study what they do with Christianity, what they do with secularity, the way in which secular values are reframed as you know, spiritual, religious, cultural values. And there's a great confusion, right? There's a great confusion. What, what are we talking about here? Is Islam an ideology, as all these populists claim, or is it a religion? Uh, is Dutch society or French society or German society really Judeo-Christian? Is it Christian in essence? What does it mean that a secular society such as the Netherlands is Christian in essence? There's a deep confusion there, and my research projects are aimed at, at participating uh, in that debate. So I opt for calling it religious studies for very specific reasons. Um, I'm not sure whether you know, the disciplinary uh, overtones of the notion of religious studies is most productive now. What I do know is, is that as theology wanes, as theology is, is, is you know, uh, dissolved in, in, in faculty, humanities faculties, it becomes an important question, who picks up the special, uh, specialization of religion, right? Where is it going to be housed? Who is going to study, you know, religious dimensions of, of, of contemporary conflicts? And you can see a little bit uh, in contemporary humanities faculties what happens if there's not a dedicated religious studies uh, field. You can see that it is taken up, pieces of it are taken up in anthropology, pieces are taken up in sociology, pieces are taken up in law. Um, unfortunately, our current situation is, is, uh, has led to the fact that these uh, people work in relative isolation of each other. Right? So you see a lot of double work being done, you see a lot of people that work within a framework. For instance, research projects that, that frame Islam as a problem of migration, research projects that frame Islam as a problem of law or something like that. Right? You need a place where speciali specialization about Islam is present and which people can reflect critically on, the, on, on what happens in other disciplines as well. So until we have a truly interdisciplinary approach to religion, in which religion is not an illustration of some other's discipline, but an integral part of a broadly interdisciplinary uh, humanities practice. Until that's the case, I opt for choosing to call myself a religious studies scholar. The, one of the things that I find important as, as scholars of religion is that we relate critically to the heritage of our very own disciplines. 
So the notion of religion, right, is an invention which arises in Western academia relatively recently. Right? So religion and secularity are two of these, these binary, are a binary position, which are used almost naturally. It's so natural you have a field of, you know, of things which are called religious, and you, you think of a uh, field of things that are non-religious. Right? We need to reflect critically on how those terminologies arose in the Western European context and whether they are fitting at all to describe Western Europe, which is so, more complex than, so much more complex than a religious secular divide, but specifically a sort of globalized world. This is of importance, secondly, because uh, I'm specifically concerned with the next generation of students, next generation of, of high school students even. Right? What kind of definition of religion are they getting? One only needs to open up a newspaper to see that that definition of religion is a deeply problematic one. And if we want to arm 21st century citizens to live in a religiously pluriform world, we need to start doing work on, on, on providing young minds you know, the framework with which to emancipate themselves from all the confusion and all the violence, uh, both discursively and, act and, and, you know, and, and actual violence, that is uh, circulating around religion. So one of the things that I find is very important is that we start uh, and, and highlighting the need for you know, new definitions of religion and start influencing the way high schools teach religion and the way in which universities uh, offer appealing programs to young students who say, well, religion is, is, will remain a central category for human societies in the, in the future. Because we can't leave it up to, to uh, ill-informed politicians and publicists to define religion. That's the academy's work.